Welcome back, everybody, this week in America. Great to have you with us on the program today. Back with us is Adam Grossman, the founder and president of Block 6 Analytics. He launched this business after working as a marketing analyst for the Washington Capitals and while receiving his Master of Business Administration degree from New York University Stern School of Business in 2010. Prior to starting the business Block 6 Analytics, he consulted with Fortune 500 companies, including McDonald's, United Healthcare, and Pfizer, on strategic technological issues. He's co author of the Sports Strategist Developing Leaders for a High Performance Industry, and he's also a junk lecturer at Northwestern University and George Mason, and a frequent guest on This Week in America. Adam, welcome back to the program. It's great to have you with us. Great to be back. Thank you. There are so many interesting things to talk about, and let's jump on the one that everybody's talking about internationally, and this is uh, uh, the whole soccer thing, FIFA, and all the problems they've been through. You know, one day we got a guy that's president of everybody, and then like less than a week later, he's like president of nobody. What happened there? What do you think went on behind the scenes? Because I'm reading now, you've got sponsors, major international sponsors that are ecstatic. This guy is leaving. Was there behind the scenes financial pressure put on FIFA? Uh, it's hard to know if there's behind the scenes financial pressure, but I think you can equate this somewhat similarly to what happened with Donald Sterling. Um, the, you know, the NBA really wanted to get Donald Sterling out, in particular because of the impact that um, his continued relationship and continued ownership of the Clippers would have on sponsors. And at a certain point, you know, we saw Visa come out, we saw Coca-Cola uh, come out, Visa in particular before uh, Sepp Blatter resigned, and then Visa, Coca-Cola, and others after Sepp Blatter resigned. They were clearly very happy with the situation. What also has come out recently is that there seems to be um, that Sepp Blatter is the focus or appears to be a focus of the Justice Department in terms of their investigation of what's going on. And also there seems to be every day more and more at least circumstantial evidence that links Sepp Blatter to what was going on in terms of the alleged uh, criminal activity in terms of the kickback and the at least $150 million that was involved in terms of illegal, um, you know, either illegal monitoring or compensation. From a fan standpoint, how should we react to this? I mean, I'm looking as a casual fan, and I'm seeing all of these problems and literally tens of millions of dollars being thrown around yeah. out there. Most of what we found are locations. They're looking for venues. But you're thinking, what happens if a game becomes involved in this? As a fan, should we worry about the integrity of, of, of some of these games? I think uh, right now there's an issue. I mean, one of the issues that keeps being brought up in terms of pr some of the problems and some of the things that lead to corruption in FIFA is this one country, one vote issue in which every country, and FIFA has actually more countries or more territories in its organization than the United Nations has in its organization, which in and of itself is pretty amazing. But the fact that each of those countries has the same vote has been a potentially a source of corruption. And, you know, what what has happened is that payments are being made to national federations um, that, you know, when you're talking about the, the same payment going to the United States versus the same payment going to Trinidad and Tobago, the obviously the uh, repercussion or the impact on a smaller country as compared to a larger country is huge. So in terms of your fan, is the World Cup in jeopardy? I don't think so. Is FIFA potentially in jeopardy? I also don't think that's the case. I think the forces are in place that are too strong to break up the organization. But you certainly can worry about the, the selection of the two locations, in particular uh, Qatar in 2022, where the average temperature is 120 degrees, and that you're taking players away from their core, um, you're taking European players away in particular from their core season to play in the winter in Qatar. You know, is there a greater chance for injury? Is there a greater chance for these players to not perform well both at the World Cup and in their uh, respective domestic leagues? That's definitely a possibility. And the fact that the bid process seems to have uh, been hampered by these allegations or by potentially by, um, you know, corruption at the highest levels of FIFA, that would worry me as a fan. And if you're talking about, you know, one of the things that has, FIFA has been compared to recently is the NFL and some of the issues that happened at the NFL but clearly, like, the NFL does not have the problem in terms of corruption at the highest levels. You may question Roger Goodell's judgment. You may question whether they're doing enough for player safety. But the idea of them awarding a Super Bowl or potentially, you know, maybe putting the, the games in locations where athletes can't, you know, can't perform at their best, that's usually not the case and not something you have to worry about with other sports leagues if you're a fan. Our guest on This Week in America, Adam Grossman. He is the founder and president of Block 6 Analytics. The website is Block 6, spelled out, S-I-X, analytics.com. The book we've talked about so often, and he's a co-author of the book, is called The Sports Strategist. And I love the book. There's so many great things in there, developing leaders for a high-performance industry. 
Uh, just a, a final thought on FIFA. Sort of lost in this about the same time we're hearing about bribery. We're also hearing reports about the number of deaths in, in Qatar as they're getting ready for the Olympics over there. Uh, basically a death a day, a construction death a day. About 1,200, they figure, so far. Could have 4,000 by the time the Olympics come around. How do they survive something like that? I would think if that was a freestanding issue, and probably behind the scenes it was going on, that you've got national sponsors. They don't want to be associated with games in venues, in a venue that, that costs 4,000 lives to be constructed. Yeah, there's some issues, particularly with countries um, that, that have particularly not great records on human rights issues um, and sponsors potentially pulling out. At the end of the day, that hasn't happened, whether you're talking about the Sochi Olympics or in Brazil for the World Cup. You know, that's a really good example of a country that had a lot of issues, particularly with construction, not only in terms of deaths, but obviously the impact on the local population to the point where the year before the World Cup, there were massive protests where a million, over a million people were in the streets because of a, a you know a hiking, a hiking bus price fare that was a significant impact that was needed to pay for these stadiums or help pay for these stadiums that directly impact the day-to-day -day, uh, people and the, the citizens who are living in Brazil. And the fact that, you know, again, there are a lot of corporate sponsors who are worried about the negative reaction that came from those events, but when the actual event went off and mostly without significant problems or significant protests in Brazil, and both in Brazil and in Sochi, you know, corporate sponsors, m for the most part, remained active in those and active in, in creating new opportunities for fans and media to engage with those brands. Um, if you're talking about Qatar, again, I think that if any country were potentially to lose a major sporting event uh, for human rights abuse and human rights issues, it could be Qatar. But again, I think it is unlikely at this point given the um, given everything that's gone on and given everything that's happened, uh, I think it would be unlikely but not impossible for them to lose the Olympic or to lose the World Cup. But you know it's definitely something to keep in mind. It's definitely something that corporate sponsors are watching extremely closely. And it's definitely something that you know as a fan, you have to be worried about and concerned about, you know, it, can you enjoy the World Cup when all these human rights abuses are going on? It, it, it makes you question. It makes you it makes it difficult for fans to w watch and love the games as much as they could and as much as they should, given what's happening in these countries. You're listening to This Week in America, our guest on the program, Adam Grossman. He is the founder and president of Block 6 Analytics, co-author of the book, The Sports Strategist, Developing Leaders for a High-Performance Industry. I would like to talk about the NBA. Where the, the season is wrapping up now, and coming up, we keep, we're keep we starting to hear a lot of talk about this. In fact, with Dwayne Wade and others, we're hearing, okay, 2016, new contracts coming in, new TV contracts, video contracts coming in. Salary cap will go up. There will be a lot more money available. Talk about what's going to happen, because, and I've read varying numbers on this, but what, like about two point something billion per year they're going to have now for uh, for, for wages, for salaries? It's not two point something billion per year. So the way that the basketball salary cap works and the way that uh, NBA players are compensated is they get 50% of what are called basketball related, uh, basketball related income, or BRI. So the way that it works is that the the, there's a new television contract. I think that's what you're referring to. Yes. There's a new ca television contract that's going to be that jumped from about nine hundred million dollars annually to about two point seven billion dollars annually, which means that the basketball players themselves are obviously due for a huge increase, and the salary cap caps are going to increase significantly. There are current rules in place that limit how much money a star player can make. So a star player can only make uh, either about twenty five or thirty five percent of the to twenty five to thirty percent of the total salary cap. Because that's the case, there are players like LeBron James or you know potentially Dwayne Wade, whose salaries are artificially lower than they could be if they had a free and open market. And in the past, a lot of the NBA uh, players, particularly the players' union, has wanted to keep star player sal salary relatively constant because it gives more uh, opportunities for players who aren't star players to make more money. Uh, if star player salaries are held in check, for for example, for LeBron James, if he's only making seventeen to nineteen million dollars a year instead of thirty to forty million dollars a year, that clearly leaves more money for the rest of his team and his teammates. Um, and so, what's going to happen is also there's going to be a huge jump in the salary cap that's available right now. It would go up to a, about a twenty to thirty million dollar per year per team increase if if there was no what they're calling revenue smoothing, which would mean that they would have a more limited jump so that teams don't all of a sudden have all this extra money. Um, the Basketball Players Union has very much uh, disagreed with that policy. They want to get as much money as they can, especially when the contract goes, you know, becomes in implemented. And there is a possibility of a, a, a lockout or a strike of some form in the NBA, not next season, but the season following. 
You know, it's interesting because as a fan, I'm watching and I'm hearing all these numbers thrown around. And it's <laughs> like my team has not done well in a while, but suddenly there is right. money available there. Maybe we can attract the free agent that we, that we haven't been able to. Let's let's use a case, for example, of, of LeBron James reportedly right. taking less than he could have taken, probably should have taken. So there's more money available for other people in, in, in the in the salary cap system so he can bring in surrounding players and compete for a championship. Right. And you see the extra money there, and I guess this is a philosophical question. Okay, <laughs> and now is the time for these people that have taken less money to step up to the plate and get rewarded for that? Or do the teams look at that and go, I'm sorry, that was yesterday. We've got to build a team for the future. We still need to have uh, surrounding players for you. How, how is that all going to sort out, do you think? I think it's going to sort out where players are, you know, what happened with the Miami Heat in terms of LeBron James, he did not take the maximum amount of salary now. I won't get into the tax law, but because of the fact that Florida doesn't have state income tax, the actual difference in his take-home pay is not as great as it could have been. But the main point here is that Dwayne Wade uh, and LeBron James both took less salary than they probably could have gotten um, other places to play on the on the Heat and create the super team that went to four straight conference finals. Going forward, the question is, if the current rules stay in place, all teams will have more money. Does that mean your team in particular that's had a couple bad years – are they going to be able to attract free agents? Um, they'll be more likely to attract free agents, but because other teams are going to have more money, they're also going to be in play in terms of tr- attracting free agents. What will be interesting is if they get rid of the cap in terms of how much money the star player can can make. And one of the things that LeBron James did when he signed his most recent contract with Cleveland is he actually has an opt-out clause at the end of this year and also only signed a two-year contract with Cleveland to begin with. So you know he actually does have the ability to... You know, he didn't sign a long-term deal like Carmelo Anthony did with the New York Knicks. He signed a, a short-term deal, even though he said he's staying in Cleveland. There is the possibility of him not staying there and potentially moving to another team that could offer him, if that you know maximum player uh, salary goes up, you know, either twenty-five or thirty million dollars a year, which is much closer to what he's worth to a team. So again, it's, it's it'll all be very interesting. As a fan, I think what's going to be interesting is what's going to happen to star players. Can you know is when Kevin Durant becomes a free agent potentially at the end of this season? Where is he going to go? Is he going to go back to Washington, where he's from, or can a team offer him more money than the Wizards can? Um, is Dwayne Wade going to sign with the Heat, even though he's been there his entire career? Is he going to potentially leave? Is Kobe Bryant would he get a you know he said this is his last year with the Lakers, but he's never said it's his last year playing in the NBA. Is it possible? He said he won't play for another team, but if the money is you know so high that you know and a team can afford to bring him in, would he sign with another team? I think it's going to be one of the most interesting off seasons that have happened once this new uh, once these new television dollars enter the league. There are a lot of commentators and analysts who look at the situation with the Lakers and say this is what happens when you pay someone for past performance. In this case, Kobe Bryant, not a lot of money left for surrounding pieces. The Lakers had a had a very poor year this year. Is there validity to that? Is that what happens when you get that whole salary cap issue out of whack and too much is going to a guy that's not contributing that much? Yeah, I think it's a little bit, it might be a little bit harsh towards the Lakers and to Kobe Bryant. When they signed that contract, you know, they had brought in Steve Nash, they had brought in Dwight Howard. They weren't necessarily, you know, they had room for those three big stars. And if they had played at the level that they had anticipated them playing, you know, the the Lakers would have been a very competitive team. Um, You know, and they still had Pal Gasol on their roster at the same time. So you can question the fact that should they have uh, paid, you know, aging superstars uh, that amount of money to compete, maybe not. You know, I, I think that's a fair argument to make. That, but the idea was that they weren't necessarily paying for past performance. They were actually trying to get the Lakers back into the playoffs and back into contention and make sure that they'd be a competitive team going forward. Now, Dwight Howard obviously signed with the Houston Rockets, and they ended up uh, letting Pal Gasol go through free agency, and Steve Nash ended up getting hurt. So in hindsight, it's easy to say that they were strictly paying for past performance. But at the time, they they thought they were not doing that. And it's also interesting to keep in mind that, you know, it, it is possible that in, it looked likely that Chris Paul was actually going to be on the Los Angeles Lakers rather than Los Angeles Clippers when that original trade was voided by the NBA. You know, they the Lakers had made moves and had tried to get the team back to a competitive place. Um, so I think that's sometimes forgotten is that the team had a different strategy and a different plan in place, but the NBA ended up vetoing the trade. And the other thing that's interesting about the Lakers, and I think you're um, you know, they do have the flexibility and the bandwidth to potentially overpay a superstar because of how successful the team is, regardless of its performance on and off the basketball court. And that's something we stress in the book is, you know, if you're talking about the teams as businesses, and we spent a lot of time today talking about that, 
you know, you want to guarantee and have the best revenue streams possible to put yourself in positions where you can attract the best talent to come to the team. And the Los Angeles Lakers clearly have done that over decades, have, you know, established uh, long-term television contracts, long-term sponsorship agreements. They put revenue streams in place so when they do have a down period where their team isn't performing as well, they can be very successful as a business. Adam Grossman, our guest on the program. He is the founder and president of Block 6 Analytics. His website is very simple, block6sixanalytics.com. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and link on directly to his website. The book is The Sports Strategist, Developing Leaders for a High-Performance Industry. A few minutes left in the program. Uh, it was sort of going to talk about boxing, and people will go, boxing? <laughs> and, but everybody's been talking about boxing for the last couple of months. Headline, New Apps Threaten TV's Golden Egg. Live sports and live sports has always been something that's sort of been exempt from all the other problems that that television is going through. We want to see an event. We don't want to tape it and watch it hours later. We want to see it as it's going on live. And through a couple of these apps out there now, people were actually watching some of the uh, the, the Mayweather Pacquiao fight. Right. Talk a little bit about what impact that's going to have on, on live sporting events and what the leagues are doing about it. Yeah, the leagues are at a very interesting point, and this is a really great point to bring up in this uh, broadcast, is the, the leagues are at a very interesting point in their development. They're trying to maximize the amount of money that they can make from digital revenue. Uh, it was just announced today that Yahoo came to an agreement for a reported $20 million to broadcast an NFL game in Europe, and Yahoo will be the sole um, organization that's testing that game um, through their digital platform. So, you know, the these especially large sports teams and leagues, but even smaller sports teams and leagues, are looking to you know, figure out new ways, new digital distribution channels, new digital rights agreements to maximize their dollars they're getting from live games. At the same time, you know, when you're talking about Periscope and Meerkat, where anybody with a cell phone can put the cell phone up and start shooting video at a live event, and you know, if it's a choice between paying $100 for the best quality television or if it's a choice between getting something for free with a lower quality video stream, especially as those video streams eventually become in higher quality, it becomes a real challenge for sports organizations. The NHL has already banned Periscope at, at some of its games. So at the same time where they're trying to get engagement and trying to get uh, people more involved in sporting events, these teams have to figure out uh, how they can you know, get people involved without losing the golden goose, so to speak. And the, the sports you know, live television rights have been driving the sports organization's growth, particularly over the last five or ten years. There's no way that sports organizations can lose that part of their revenue stream. So the more easily they can, you know, this is definitely going to be one of the biggest challenges facing sports organizations for the near future. I mentioned that you're uh, an adjunct lecturer at Northwestern University and George Mason University, about a minute or so left in the program with, with Adam Grossman. Talk about the reaction of students. I mean, these are going to be the sports consumers for years to come. Are they satisfied? I mean, I would like to see a fight, not necessarily pay $100, but I would like to see it on my big screen TV and enjoy it. Uh, do they care exactly how they're getting it? Or they, they're used to watching things on a five or six inch screen, possibly. Are they okay with that? that? Yeah, that's streaming, that Periscope, that's great. I was able to watch the fight. It cost me nothing. Yeah, I think that's, so that's two areas where I think they're the, the next generation, particularly of people who are getting into the sports business and also becoming sports fans, are different than the previous generation. One is that they are used to consuming content on mobile devices and on tablets. But, you know, again, when you're talking about lower, um, potentially lower video quality in distribution, students are more and more likely and younger generations are more and more likely to cut the cord, so to speak. That means they're not going to have cable subscriptions and they're not going to have satellite subscriptions. And, you know, they, they don't necessarily want all the channels that maybe come with a, a traditional cable or satellite package. They want the content they want. They want to consume it in the channel. They want to consume it, and they want to have access to it for a relatively low cost. So, you know, again, I think it's definitely a huge issue. It's something that sports organizations at the highest level are looking at. How do we make sure that we can monetize, uh, monetize these younger fans? And it's not just sports organization. HBO has recently launched its own um, digital streaming service where for the first time you don't actually have to be a cable subscriber in order to get HBO content. You can get a solely digital subscription. And HBO as a company has has been successful because of the amount of money it gets from every cable and satellite subscriber. So it's it probably is, if not the biggest, one of the biggest challenges facing the sports industry, you know, over the next five or ten years. When we have Adam back, and we will in a few weeks on the program, we'll pick it up with that. In talking about Verizon, and they would like to do with the uh, non-bundle, and you've got ESPN and others say, no, 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 check the contract, you can't do that. 
And also, people, we mentioned the, the boxing match, uh, Mayweather and Pacquiao. Some were upset about that and filed class action lawsuits because they felt this is, this was a fraud, that uh, the shoulder injury to Pacquiao should have been acknowledged before. I, boy, and this is really opening up something that every time you've got a bad sporting event, you're going to go to federal court. We'll talk about that in the next program. <laughs> Our guest has been Adam Grossman. He is the founder and president of Block 6 Analytics. His website is block6sixanalytics.com. The book is The Sports Strategist, Developing Leaders for a High-Performance Industry. And as you you found in listening to the program, the season isn't just, well, the season's year-round. It, it's not just what happens on the field or, or in the uh, the arena. It happens year-round. It's a fascinating topic, and we'll have Adam back in the program. And again, information available at Adam's website, block6analytics.com. Our website this week in America.us. Adam, thanks for being with us on the program. I look forward to having you back. Thanks. Looking forward to coming back. And all the information available, Adam and all of our guests at our website this week in America.us.